Welcome on stage aus Adelaide, South Australia, Shocks and Frillo aus Semorana. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd just like to uh, say it's a bit of a hard act to follow Massimo Batura. Big shoes to fill those. Thanks for that. Put me uh, last. Um, and thank you, Thomas and Carola, for inviting me over here. It's, uh, it's um, very humbling to be asked to be to, to come over here and show what we do in Australia. So we are very proud to have you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start at the beginning because uh, obviously uh, I'm from Glasgow, from Scotland, and uh, I've got a couple of restaurants in in, uh, in Australia, and. Um, I'm not cooking Scottish food. Uh, I'm also half Italian, as you can probably guess by the second name. So uh, this journey that I'm on, which I'm going to try and sort of highlight uh, over the next 30 minutes as briefly as I can, started for me as a, as a young kid. Mum was Scottish, dad was Italian, and um, I had two very different sides to my family growing up. We had uh, boiled potatoes and mince in one side uh, in my grandparents' house, and we had, you know, elaborate del Italian delicatessens with, with aromas of, of fresh baked focaccia and, and salumi and olives and cheese and, and on the other side, and, and big long tables with, you know, the typical Italian family with arms going everywhere and pasta sauce up the walls and whatever. And then the next day, boiled potatoes and mince. So from a very young age, I became culturally aware as it were, you know, there was the, the, there is a difference between people culturally, um, and and in my family it was it was both, and I learned to like both at different stages in my life. Sometimes I hated the Scottish culture, you know, the mean, stoic, uh, plain uh, environment that that a lot of Scots have versus, you know, the elaborate sort of. Uh, uh, eccentricness of the Italian side of my family, but you know it chopped and changed as I grew, uh, and sometimes I loved the Italian side more than the Scottish, and, and vice versa. Today I kind of I'm, I'm at one with it, but it really started for me uh, a, a journey in food from a very young age, um, and learning from both sides of my family, two very different types of cooking, two very different flavors, two very different um, cultural meanings behind the food that I ate every day. Um, when I started cooking, uh, I went down the Michelin star route and I worked for Marco Pierre White and Gordon Ramsay and, and I was in London and, and did this, did the whole, you know, I wanted three Michelin stars. And uh, I very quickly realized uh, that three Michelin stars were for me, just, they weren't for me, it wasn't what I wanted to do. And, and I couldn't in my heart of hearts say that I really wanted to open a, a three Michelin star restaurant and run it. It just wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to do something more, fulfill more fulfilling with, with my career. So uh, one, uh, I got out of London. I just made the decision, we're going to take a break. So I decided to go to Australia. And uh, very naively, I landed in Australia. And um, I was very surprised, <laughs> like I said, very, very naive. I kind of didn't realize that it was a city uh, where I landed in Sydney. And there was the, 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 the Harbour Bridge and the, the Opera House and big skyscrapers and, and uh, you know, I, I, I thought, where are all the kangaroos? Where are all the Aboriginal people? You know, um, really naive, like I said. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, what I did find, though, was a very, I felt, racist country. Um, you know, they, 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 the country's settled by my people, uh, by the world. You know, everyone, you know, Dutch, Scottish, English, you know, a lot of European settlement um, and a lot of Asian settlement, but you know, nobody, the, the, the Aboriginal culture are, are kind of, it's like a third world country. You go out to an Aboriginal community uh, in the outback, it's like going back in time. You know, the first, when I first started going out into communities 2000, 2001, there was, and I kid you not, I'm not lying, there was a black fellas pub and a white fellas pub. Can you believe that? In 2000, 2001. I mean, it, you know, it just, for me, it was crazy. So when I spent 12 months anyway, I ended up in Sydney. I stayed in Sydney. I worked at a restaurant. It was the best restaurant in Sydney at the time. 
uh, three hats equivalent of three stars. And uh, I started playing around with uh, or, or inquiring about indigenous food and Aboriginal food and Aboriginal culture and why w could you not see that in any of the restaurants. So uh, we started to, you know, make some, some of these ingredients into the menu and, and we got slated by the food reviewers because in the 1980s there was a, a bush food kind of revolution that happened in, in Australia and it was done very, very badly. Uh, they basically got some native ingredients, sprinkled them across a European menu and said, this is Australian food. So there was no thought process behind any cultural significance, any seasonality, any uh, flavor profile, any uh, meaning uh, geographically, regionally to, to the ingredients or the people where those ingredients came from. They just simply thought, yeah, that'll do. We'll, we'll just put that across there. Of course, it didn't work. And everybody hated bush tucker. So, and that was what we were branded, bush tucker. So when I started putting this stuff on this menu, this three very fancy menu, uh, one of the food reviewers at the time in Sydney, Sydney Morning Herald, slated the restaurant really badly. And the guy who owned the restaurant said, look, Jock, I, I admire what you're trying to do and trying to think about this, but I can't afford to, <laughs> to have a really bad review and, and lose business to the restaurant. So... Uh, I left the industry. I, I stopped cooking. I, I started importing, believe it or not, thermal mixes and knives, and, and uh, I started doing consultancy and kitchen fitouts and restaurant fitouts, and I did that for years. But while I did that, I started to, I, I realised there was a problem. Uh, you know, f I, I could I could create this thought process of an Australian cuisine, an Australian gastronomy. I could I could have that idea, but. You know, how am I going to, how could I convince anybody of this? You know, it was impossible after the history of the bush tuck in the 1980s. So um, I realized that I didn't know anything, basically, nothing about, about Australia and Australian people, the first Australians. So um, I decided to go out and start visiting communities one by one, just, say, just go and speak to Aboriginal people and work out what it is. I had been told, so I'm going to tell you a story now, and then we're going to watch a video, so I'm going to probably have to hurry up as well. The, the first Aboriginal person I spoke to, seriously about food, okay, was after I'd been told by chefs, journalists, uh, uh, everyday people who I met in the pub when I was having a drink and asking questions of, of Aboriginal culture and, and meaning. Um, all of these people said to me, Jock, forget about Aboriginal food, it doesn't exist. Forget about Aboriginal ingredients, they're shit. Forget about... Uh, forget about this idea, it's nonsensical, you know, stick to doing uh, three missional staff food and you'll have a successful restaurant and it will be fantastic. Don't even bother, was what I got told. After mulling this over and immigrating in 2000, I went down to, everybody knows where Cir Circular Quay with the Harbour Bridge and the Opera House is, right? Big tourist des destination. Aboriginal guys kind of hang out there and, uh, and they'll play drums, didgeridoos, etc. I, the guy was playing a didgeridoo sitting on the ground. I sat next to him and I started asking him questions about what he remembered as a, as a, as a child growing up. Memories of food. What did you eat? You know, your elders, what, did they teach you or, or did you watch or what happened? Anyway, this, I, I, it, it changed, that, that moment changed my life. And it changed a lot of the preconceptions I had about food, you know, after having been in kitchens for, for years, decades. And what he told me, I, I started having this, this conversation. One of the things he told me was about fish. You go fishing for barramundi, and then they stuff the barramundi with a lime tree, and then they cook it on a fire. And I was like, okay. And he said, but, Jock, not just any kind of fire. It has to be the specific acacia wood only. We only cook this fish on that. My people cook the fish on this wood. And I was thinking, that's, that's, pre that's pretty specific. You know, it's very specific, right? For, for a, you know, initially I was thinking for a culture that I got told it's just they eat to, for sustenance. That's it. So I thought, okay, go on. So he's talking about building the fire and getting the, the embers to the right temperature, then tapping the coals to make them nice and hot and then laying the fish with the scale still on, stuffed with this lime tree on it, and then covering it eucalyptus so as the smoke, you know, permeates through the fish. I, you know, I'm, that, 
And, and, and he's talking about aromas and smells and what happens to the, the protein of the fish. You know, he's talking about the bubbles. You know, when you cook fish, right, and the, and the, 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 the proteins coagulate, and then you, you start to see it inside. Yeah, he's, he's talking about this, very specific. Aboriginal guy, homeless, plain of didgeridoo, in Sukuluki. I very quickly realized that what I'd been told was bullshit. They don't eat for sustenance. They eat for pleasure. They eat with a... Uh, conscience to their culture. They eat with, uh, for pleasure. What he told me uh, was not somebody who just eats because they're hungry. I mean, yes, he's eating because he's hungry, but he doesn't need to go to that level to get the right wood, to cook it a certain way, to use a certain eucalyptus to cover it so as the smoke permeates because it smells and tastes better. You know, you get the message. So, this, uh, and it's funny, you know, we use uh, 50, 60, 70 ingredients at any one time through a, a season on, on our menu. We have, uh, we have um, six seasons in, in the Aboriginal calendar, as it were, and we observe those six seasons instead of the traditional four because it makes more sense with the, the ingredients that we use. Um, he was telling me about this lime tree. And I was naively, again, thinking, oh, you know, like a kaffir lime tree, right? You know, so I, was, I drew like a kaffir lime leaf, and he's like, no, 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 he drew a needle. It wasn't until six years later that I found out what that was. When I was out with a community up in the Kimberley, we went fishing, and the guy, it was pitch black, cooking around the fire. He'd caught barramundi out of the Fitzroy River. Um, cro crocodiles everywhere, that's another story. But... Um, he, he was stiff, like what, what looked like herbs in the dark to me, stuffed the fish, and then he did you know, virtually the same thing, slightly different, on the fire, leaves over. I asked him what it was. He said, he'll show me in the morning. Then he showed me this, this shrub, um, which is called Geraldton wax. Now, Geraldton wax, this is how crazy is, the, the ingredients that we use should be used widely in Australia, which is what we're trying to do, I guess, and, and create this gastronomy. But this is one example of how nonsensical Australia looks at food uh, and, and food that grows naturally without irrigation uh, is drought resistant, etc. This is one example. This shrub is called Geraldton wax, okay? Um, Aboriginal people have been, have been using it for 50,000 years. Oldest surviving culture in the world, Aboriginal people. Unbelievable, right? He, show, he shows me this uh, shrub and it's like kind of looks like a, a baby pine tree, I suppose, but more branchy, more like a shrub. And I taste it, and it tastes like a combination of lemongrass and kaffir lime. Unbelievable. Like, the flavor was, was so unbelievable. Then, today, you can go, even today in Australia, this, this shrub, okay, is not available next to rosemary or thyme or lemongrass in the supermarket. But... 268 varieties of that shrub you can buy in the garden center for your garden. What the fuck? It's so crazy. It, it, it doesn't, you know, they don't, they, they, there's no, there's, there's been no understanding of, of the culture in terms of food at all, nothing. It's like, here's Aboriginal, I mean, we know the history of Aboriginal people. They landed, they tried to kill them all, it didn't work. Then they tried to, to, to breed them out, that didn't work. Much the same as Scottish culture. Uh, then, they try, then, they, then they stole the children. They stole generations of Aboriginal children. And that didn't work either. So um, anyway, cut a long story short. What we do, I've got two restaurants. One is called Street. We do street food from around the world, but we use indigenous ingredients from Australia. We don't talk about the ingredients. We don't mention the ingredients. We just say, uh, it's a, uh, you know, a sea sig from Philippines, for example. It's a fried black carrot cake from Singapore. It's a hot dog, except we make it with crocodile. We call them croc dogs or hop dogs made from kangaroo. Then we've got Arana, which is uh, more formal, like a fine dining restaurant, and we really take you on a journey. We sit you down and, and have reference to specific places in Australia, specific cultures, and with those ingredients that are found. When I visited those cultures, we have an interpretation of that combined with recent culture. So it's not, I'm not suggesting we all put on one cloth and cook a bit of meat around fire, no. It's more about a collaboration. You know, white people landed in Australia almost 240 years ago, which isn't long. Um, Aboriginal people have been there for 50,000 years. 
So while the cuisine that we're, I'm thinking, imagining what is Australian cuisine, if you, if you go to Spain, you go to Italy, you go to China, you go to Japan, you can taste, it's quite obvious that you're eating Japanese food, right? It's quite obvious that you're now eating Italian food or Spanish food. When you go to Australia, you've got no idea what it is you're eating. You can eat fantastic cuisine from all over the world, but can you really taste something Australian, taste the country, the culture? I don't think you can. Um, then came the question, um, what, what is Australian cuisine and, and, and where do we start, in fact? Um, because, you know, as a culture, I want to be respectful for their culture, but at the same time, you know, we're here as, as white people in Australia, and so that also has to be acknowledged and, and worked into some kind of cuisine because, you know, as Bruno there says, we're all one, right? It's, it's not them and us. Um, and so whatever the gastronomic nature of Australia looks like in the future, it, it's, it's us, it's one, it's the, the, there has to be a unity. So the dish there, funnily enough, that it was plating there was crocodile. And underneath it was mangrove seeds. And mangrove seeds, uh, I, ate, I tried mangrove seeds once and they're, they're really, really bitter, very, very bitter. Then I went to a community and, uh, and saw them harvest the seeds. They then put them, uh, the, there was like a, a set of caves near the beach, um, and they had like pits. They're like old rock formations, basically with holes. And they put the mangrove seeds in there and filled it up with salt water. They were lacto-fermenting the mangrove seeds to make them edible. Incredible, right? Been doing it for tens of thousands of years. So that dish ended up being crocodiles. Crocodiles hang out in the mangroves. So we, we went on this journey of creating that dish. Took a long time to work with crocodiles. Very, very tough meat. Um, but through the guys up in Arnhem Land and visiting communities, we were able to work out the process of that dish. It's got huge cultural significance to Arnhem Land uh, and the people in it. Um, so again, like I said, the, 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 the working out what Australian gastronomy is. What I wanted to do somehow, though, was forget about being a chef for a moment, but culturally, as well as try and define what Australian gastronomy might look like to me, um, I wanted to help Aboriginal communities. I wanted to give back, you know? And so the, the mantra of our work was always give back more than you take. And we've been mind mindful of that from, from day one when we go and visit any community. And so I had the idea to create a foundation that would, that would do exactly that. Um, I tried unsuccessfully for years, five years, six years to try and do it. And it wasn't until I started working with friends of mine, Alex Atala, went over to Brazil, had a look at Atai's institute that he started, learned from his mistakes, and started to realize that there was a path through politics that I had to go in order to create this foundation. While I was doing that, I wasn't content to wait, sit on my hands and just wait for some bullshit politician to say, it's okay, now you can create, and now you can do something good. I went out, and the guy who's in that video, Bruno, um, he's a, a new, new elder. And uh, I went up there eight years ago and said, uh, I said, hey, you've got all this fruit growing here naturally. How about... Um, you get all the new, new people to pick the fruit in the wild orchards and uh, take it to the store. I'll put a chest freezer in there. And whatever fruit is harvested, they bring in, you know, if someone brings in one and a half kilos of fruit, then the guys in the shop will pay them for the one and a half kilos of fruit. And it gives something back to the community. Because, like I said, this is, is honestly, it's like third world. So, we made an agreement that whatever was harvested in those freezers, I would pay for. And I thought to myself, this first year I did it, eight years ago, I thought, yeah, you know, how much fruit can they possibly pick? I mean, you know, they weren't very enthusiastic about it the first time. Um, anyway, 200 kilos of fruit later, um, I went to pick it up, and we, we were able to give that community $4,000 for the fruit. We paid them above average price for fruit. And um, that was fantastic. Now, this year, some, uh, this is the ninth, ninth year that they've done it. 
they picked nine tons of fruit. Nine tons. So it's over $300,000 to that community, which is, I can't tell you. I mean, that's this year. Obviously, last year there was two hundred and something thousand dollars It's grown every year more and more and more. More people from that community are getting in on that project. But the important thing for me was is it was great to start that project. But very quickly, I, I, I made sure that I empowered that community and gave it back to them. Because it's not about me, and it's not about us, it's about them and their own empowerment. So um, that's one, one project off of our own back without the foundation um, that we're able to do. Paul's going to uh, go outside. They've got some kangaroo here. I'm going to make a kangaroo dish that we make it work. Um, there's a place called the AP Wildlands, which uh, sits, kind of borders uh, South Australia and the Northern Territory, right in the center of the country. It's a desert, it's barren. Um, and we, I went out there and visited. What happens is they take the life of a kangaroo. They skin the kangaroo, and then they take the two loins out the back, and they cook them directly on the fire. And then they serve it with various grasses and grass seeds. Um, quite simply. It, and then the rest of it, the shoulders, the legs, the tail, get buried uh, either sometimes under the sand, depends which community you're in, or sometimes under the coals, actually. So um, what we're doing here is, a, a, I guess, a, a variation of that. Um, in here, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different types of uh, weeds. And Obviously, the weeds grow uh, in amongst the grass. It's something that, that people don't think about. Grass is grass, but it is. You can smoke it, or you can, uh, you, you can, uh, you can eat it also as well. Gra I mean, flour comes from grass, right? I mean, grass is a lot of things people don't realize. But in rich grass that attracts kangaroos, uh, and Aboriginal people work this out, is there are it's not just blades of grass. There are, there are other weeds that the kangaroos come in for. So when, you, when, when the first settlers came to Australia, they looked at the landscape and said, wow, it's perfectly manicured, wide expanses of grass, light forest, dense forest. It's like a natural garden. Stupid, so stupid. It was designed that way and manicured that way by the hunter-gatherers, the Aboriginal people, because they knew that they had to provide the environment for the kangaroos to come in and feed. So the kangaroos sleep in the, in the light forestation uh, during the day, in the dense forestation during the day. Then as, as the, it comes out, dawn and dusk, they come out into the light forestation and then they get in there and eat the fresh grass. Aboriginal people were collecting grass seeds and putting them around these areas so as they could hunt the kangaroo. I mean, it's, again, it's a misunderstanding of, of, uh, of culture, essentially. Um, and that's part of the problem and part of the, part of the solution at the end of the day to creating some kind of recognizable cuisine for Australia. So Paul's doing this kangaroo. We're going to sear it at the other side. We've got a few different types of grasses. I've got some beetroot. This is just golden beetroot, which uh, has been uh, sliced on a mandolin very, very thinly, seasoned with some salt. Beetroot has become, this is like a reference to today's culture. Beetroot in Australia is massive. Australians are obsessed with beetroot. Obsessed. It's in burgers. It's in. Uh, it's crazy. Everyone. There's a whole beetroot thing going on over there, which is good. So we we'll use it in this dish. Um, this is a pepper sauce. Um, uh, very shortly, I was in Singapore. I ate black pepper crab. Amazing. Uh, and I decided because there were so many native peppers to Australia that were insanely good, I thought, let's make a native version of that, of that black pepper paste with that sort of Asian influence. So it has uh, native ginger, native lemongrass. Um, there's a soy that we ferment using pandanus of our own. Um, and, uh, and three different types of native pepper. So these three different types of native pepper have different attributes. Some of them are sort of Willy Wonka. They take 45 seconds, and then they hit you like a train <laughs> for about 30 seconds, and then it disappears. Other ones are fruity, uh, and the last one just has this, this, this umami undertone as a pepper. So we use some of that. This is uh, uh, um, ramsins, wild garlic, 
um, which we've liked to fermented, and the flowers from them. Again, another type of grass. Um, in Australia, we don't actually have ramsins. We've got three-cornered garlic, but no, uh, no ramsins. So now, uh, I just need the, we had a few problems with the fire, <laughs> trying, to, uh, trying to do the kangaroo. Um, so that's it. I'm going to play this in a minute. But the, this is, I, I suppose, a, a, an impression for me of a, of a dish that captures traditional culture in Australia, but also modern culture. Um, and one of the key things in, in this particular dish is the way that we played it. Um, there is, uh, there are a lot of languages, Aboriginal languages in Australia. Arana, the name of my restaurant, in fact, actually means welcome, um, the word, um, in about five or six different Aboriginal languages. There are over 460 languages, Aboriginal dialect in Australia. So it's very, very difficult f to, I guess, work in, in, in this field because, uh, it's impossible to learn all those languages, right? There are similarities, sure, within them, but realistically, not a lot. Um, this, the way that we plate this dish, however, is in the shape of a kangaroo's footprint. And a kangaroo footprint and an emu footprint is two of the things that don't change in any of those 460 languages. It's the same thing. It's a visual, it's a visual thing. Um, so for me, it was very, uh, it was very obvious. You know, we're going we're gonna to do a kangaroo dish. Let's let's plate it in in the symbol of a of a kangaroo's footprint. I guess that you will see anywhere in caves or uh, often in sand paintings, you'll see them do it as well. Um, I need the kangaroo, really. <laughs> you know, I've run out of words now. Um, Straight is, uh, like I said, Arana's kind of, Arana's the, 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 the fine dining version, if you like. Street's kind of an excuse to, to, to prove that indigenous ingredients uh, are, are perfectly usable in any environment whatsoever. Like, they don't have to be specialist or, thank you, they don't have to be specialist, they don't have to be... Uh, uh, only for a luxury experience or whatever. It's more about, you know, showing that these ingredients which grow naturally in Australia are drought resistant, don't need irrigation, and can give back to community, can be used in, in any, any type of cuisine. You know, I've got friends of mine now who are cooking Asian food but using indigenous ingredients because they've seen some of the stuff that we get. That's, that's fantastic. That's what I want. That's what I want to see because... You know, as long as we are irrigating hectares of land to grow iceberg lettuces, there's a problem. There's a huge problem. When the, when the country is full of ingredients that, that grow with, with no water and are drought resistant and potentially can be harvested, grown, and cultivated by indigenous communities, and therefore we can give back. This kangaroo loin has basically just been charred, what we call dirty, so straight on the hot coals, just as it was when I seen it in the AP Wildlands. And then, it's cooked, literally, it's just seared, and it's made rare, well, blue, really. And like I said earlier, this is something I've seen in, in AP, AP Wildlands. These guys, this is the first time I ate this dish practically, or, or the first variation of it, as I, as I call it, um, was sitting around a fire um, with a bunch of guys in the community. And I was blown away by it, actually, because just the, the I guess, the, the relevance of what I was eating to where I was and the people where I was, you know, it was cooked a very unique way. They had they had hunted it and and it was served with all these grasses that the women of the community had gathered, uh, and then they all shared it. It was it was it was to me it was very very special, um, and the flavour uh, you know of, of it was incredible. It wasn't you know what I had been led to believe uh, of you know something that had been burnt in a fire and was very dry and chewy and horrid. 
uh, it was just actually delicious. So I decided to do a version of it. Now, so basically sliced, seasoned, And then, I'm going to make the shape of the kangaroo footprint. The first time I showed this to uh, the guy who, who originally gave me, uh, Dan, who, who gave me the kangaroo in the community. And I showed him what I'd done out of respect uh, and asked if it was okay. And, and I, I really wanted to know what he thought of it. Um, he cried because he had a, an immediate connection with, with my people and his people. In, in something that, that I had learned, you know? I think for years in Australia, um, we've taken, but we've never given back. And I think through food, we can change that. A lot of people have never had kangaroo before. Um, if you haven't had kangaroo before, once they've taken a photograph of this, I urge you to pop up and have a little taste of it because as well as being ridiculously healthy, uh, it's a nice lean meat, but it's very, very tender uh, and very juicy, surprisingly. Next, I'm going to put some of the beetroot. Actually, no, I'm going to put some of the sauce. So the sauce is, is really, because of the pepper, it's really quite hot. Um, spicy hot, not heat hot. Um, but what it does is add this complexity to to the uh, the dish, because the meat is very, very, very lean, it gives it a whole different kind of dimension, almost buttery because of the, the effect that the pepper has on your palate, it really makes your palate work. And so in the absence of fat, all of a sudden you have these, your taste buds are going mental. We're not going crazy with the uh, with the beetroot, but just want enough to to break out. The beetroot gives a beautiful sweetness to the dish. And finally, I'm going to start adding the weeds. So this is the direction 
that the uh, the kangaroo would travel in, I guess you could say, which is the way we present it to the guests. I think Thomas, actually, you you guys photographed a version of this, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. It was slightly different. It's published in Port Kuwana, available from a good bookstore near you. Thank you. <laughs> but it was a different version, right? This is the fun. Well, this is the thing, yeah, but then, you know, this is influenced by a particular place that I've visited in terms of a community. And so the ingredients, the sauce, the everything continues to change and evolve depending on where I've been. And so there are... I, do you know what? I don't even know how many variations of this dish, and, and, but they're all regionally significant to somewhere that I've been uh, and people that I've met. So lastly, we have a, uh, a thyme oil, um, which is a, is a, it's a type of thyme, very different than, uh, than a European thyme, but grows in the, in the grassy areas. Um, it's very strong. It doesn't taste like thyme. I'm not actually sure why it's called thyme, even, but uh, it has this kind of uh, fermented umami kind of flavor, just as a herb. We use it a lot in uh, cooking meats, um, but we also use it when we make grass oil. So typically, our forager will go out and pick you know, some nice fresh grass as we would for this, along with blades of grass. And we would then make the grass oil along with the thyme um, to make this bright, rich, grassy green oil. There are um, a lot of different um, kind of kangaroos, uh, different species. That's right. Uh, but, but you use only the wallaby and, and the big red one for cooking, or? No, we use, uh, it depends what we're doing. Um, if we're cooking, we'll use eastern gray kangaroo. Okay. Um, this, is a, this is a red kangaroo. Yeah, um, but it's farmed, huh? It's which? Wild or farmed? Um, it's wild. All, there are no farmed kangaroos. Um, th and there are many problems with the idea of kangaroo as well. The government... Um, haven't quite worked out what to do with uh, kangaroos in terms of processing. So it's only wild harvest that happens at the moment. Um, and unfortunately, they don't get treated the same way as a cow or a pig or, or anything. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's kind of, you're not allowed to take the livers or the hearts or you know all the good bits that you, you would, we would want as a chef to use, uh, we're not allowed to. Yeah. Um, so we, we have a fight with the government every month trying to change uh, some laws. And also, if you have a farm, if you have a vineyard, um, and kangaroos come and eat your grapes, yeah. you have I've to apply. I've seen that in Barossa Valley. Yeah, exactly. It's a beautiful you picture. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you have to <laughs> apply for a uh, license to shoot, to cull some kangaroos from your land. Mm -hmm. They'll give you a license to shoot 50 kangaroos. There's another 500 behind those 50. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. And when you shoot those 50 kangaroos, you have to put a tag in its ear and let it rot in the paddock. You're not allowed to eat it. How stupid is that? I mean, it, it doesn't make sense, no? no? Absolutely not. So the grass oil is last. So literally just a few drops. And that's the finished dish. Kangaroo footprint. Cool. <laughs> yeah. That's a fancy machine, Thomas. Okay, lovely. All right, um, that's it for me. Listen, thank you very much for listening to me ramble on about uh, gastronomy. Uh, uh. So thank you. thank you so much for being here. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you I so much. A little present for you.
This is our Chef's Sache Knife. Wow. The 2015 edition. It's a Porsche. It's a Porsche, yeah, but uh, it's, it's a German designer by Japanese steel. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you very Thank much. You. So good to have you. Thank yeah. you.